Disclosures for this and all episodes in this series can be found on the podcast series destination page located on education.webmd.com. The following presentation is copyrighted by WebMD Education. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of WebMD Education. The following podcast is supported by an independent educational grant from Moderna, Inc. Well, good day, everybody. My name is Dr. Greg Polin, and I'm a professor of medicine and infectious diseases at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Welcome to this podcast episode called, What Are Respiratory Viral Infections? This is part of a six episode podcast series, What to Know About COVID-19, the Flu and RSV. And today I'm speaking with an expert, Dr. Angela Branch, Dr. Branch, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the kind of work you do? Sure, and thank you for having me, Dr. Poland. So my name is Dr. Angela Branch, and I'm an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York. I'm also an infectious disease physician, and I spend a lot of time treating adults who end up hospitalized with serious infections, and respiratory infections are just one of those kinds. I spend a lot of time educating people about these infections so that they can know how to protect themselves and and live their healthiest lives. That's great, Angela. Thank you. We're pleased to have you because we're going to spend our time today talking about respiratory viral infections. But what exactly are viruses? Well, that's a great question, uh, Dr. Poland. So I think we've all learned a lot about viruses during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's, It's become such a big buzzword in every household in America. Um, But it is important to drill down a little bit and talk about exactly what we talk about when we're saying respiratory viral infections. So viruses are organisms similar to lots of different kinds of organisms that live ubiquitously in the environment. But these particular kinds of organisms are so small that you can't actually see them unless you use a microscope. And they're found in every place on the earth and in every type of animal or plant species. But a virus doesn't have everything it needs to make more copies of itself. That's what distinguishes it from bacteria. Viruses actually need to enter into the building block of all tissue called cells. And, you know, all human tissue is made up of cells. That's sort of the building block of everything. And so viruses actually need to enter into those cells and use the cells equipment and machinery to replicate itself or make more copies of itself. And then it escapes and goes on to infect other cells. In the process of sort of infecting these cells and using the cells machinery to make more copies of itself, it actually damages those cells. And that's sort of what leads to disease as we know it. And if you infect enough cells, you develop symptoms. And for the viruses we're gonna talk about today, because the site of infection involves what we call the respiratory tract, which starts at your nose, goes all the way down to your lungs. That's why we call those respiratory virus infections, because it uses cells in the nose, the sinuses, the throat, the airways, and the lungs to cause infection. And if enough of those cells become infected, then you develop an illness in one of those areas. That's a really good explanation and a thorough one. Thank you. And I think it's an important distinction to make for our listeners that these types of infections, as you mentioned, are different than bacterial infections, because you can also have an infection caused by bacteria, but bacteria and viruses are two very different types of organisms. Bacteria are single-celled organisms that can reproduce on their own, unlike viruses, as you just mentioned. So when you have a bacterial infection, It's an illness that's explained by bacterial growth or the toxins that bacteria release. And there are a lot of different types of uh, bacteria. But two important points here are that you can have co-infection, meaning that you can have a viral infection that actually predisposes you to a subsequent or concomitant bacterial infection. And that's because these infections are caused by different organisms we have different ways to treat them. Yeah, that's a really important distinction. Um, And thank you for making it, Dr. Poland. I I think some of us respiratory virologists or people who study respiratory viruses do think that viruses sort of set up the perfect storm for you to get 
a bacterial infection and all of the consequences that come with that. But at first, and maybe only, sometimes you just have a viral infection. And if you do get that kind of infection, we will want to know what kind. We'll want to know, is it viral or bacterial or both? And if it's virus, even what kind of virus you're infected with matters. You can also be infected with more than one types of viruses at the same time. So let's talk about just viruses, though. There are lots of different kinds of viruses. Sometimes we refer to viral infections as the common cold (laughs) because the common cold is one type of illness that's often caused by a group of viruses. Lots of viruses can cause the common cold, but one group is what we call the rhinoviruses. This usually infects your upper respiratory tract. So everything you think of when you think of the common cold, the sniffles, congestion, sinus pressure or pain, a sore throat. That's what we call the common cold. And again, that's usually caused by a group of virus called the rhinovirus family. But not all respiratory viruses cause just the common cold. And I think that's where sometimes we don't, as a community, understand the threat of viruses because we think, oh, well, it's just a cold. But while some viruses will just cause the cold, meaning they'll affect your upper airways, your nose, your sinuses, your throat, and just stay there. There are some viruses that are much more threatening and they can descend into the lower parts of your respiratory tract, such as your airways and cause bronchitis or go down to your lungs and cause pneumonia. And some viruses can even go beyond that. They can damage other organs and and systems throughout the bodies. We've seen a lot of this with COVID, for example, which is caused by a type of virus called coronavirus. Now, there are lots of coronaviruses. Some of them we get infected with every season and they cause the common cold. But this specific coronavirus is something called the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2 because it's known to cause a much more severe disease that can cause damage to your heart, to your liver, to your lungs. It's a pretty serious virus. Influenza can cause infection of your lungs, but also can affect other organs. And then there are other viruses. Respiratory syncytial virus is one of the common viruses that we see every winter season. You might have heard of it as RSV. Specifically, there's three that we worry the most about. COVID, of course, but also influenza and respiratory syncytial virus in any given season. That's a really great overview, Dr. Branch. Thank you. And you're, you're right that we're not going to be able to outline every single respiratory viral infection here today, but it's good to know that there are many and that importantly, you can have more than one at the same time. It's also important to know that viruses exist year round. We think of respiratory viruses, of course, during the winter season, and certain of those do have a season, and that's when they're most common in the U.S., The exact reason for why some viruses are more common during certain times of the years is not exactly known, but uh, air pressure, temperature, indoor crowding during colder weather are all thought to play a part. But importantly, the seasons for different viruses and infections can also overlap or happen at the same time. And this is important because it goes back to what we said about being able to have more than one infection more than one viral infection at the same time. And getting one infection or getting sick and having your body be compromised can sometimes make it easier for you to get other viruses and illnesses as we've noted. So Dr. Branch, let's go into a little more detail about the three primary ones we're gonna focus on, COVID-19, influenza, and respiratory syncytial virus. Sure. Well, to start, I want to just point out that these viruses, they don't select by age or by region or anything like that. When they're circulating, anyone can get infected with them. What is different sometimes is the degree of illness that you get with COVID-19 or flu or RSV by age. So we're all susceptible. We can all become infected and we can all develop an illness. And when we develop an illness, then we're able to spread the virus mostly through droplets from our respiratory tract, which then goes on to be inhaled and subsequently leads to infection. And so anyone can get it, anyone can transmit it, but depending on who you are and what sort of underlying illnesses you have, and even your age, 
how severely that infects you is where you sometimes see the difference. But because anyone can get it and anyone can transmit it, we all need to be cognizant of these viruses and also do our best to prevent them and prevent ourselves from becoming infected and spreading the virus when we can. So let's talk a little bit about transmission, because I think that's something that's really important, and, and it's sort of one of our best lines of defenses against respiratory viruses when they're circulating. COVID and influenza are mainly spread through the air when someone infected talks, coughs, or sneezes. That's because the viruses exist in the water droplets that are sort of a part of your secretions or your saliva, even the fluid that's in your nose. Those are what we call secretions, and the viruses there are millions of copies of them sometimes in these droplets. And so whenever you talk or you cough or you sneeze, then it enters into the air and somebody near you can then become infected if those droplets land there near their eyes, their mouth, or their nose, and they're able to then um, sort of latch on to that person's airways and start to infect cells. RSV is a little bit different because not only does it spread in that way, but additionally, RSV can land on surfaces. And when it lands on surfaces, it can actually live on those surfaces for a few hours. And so even just having RSV sort of land on, you know, your phone or a desk nearby or a doorknob, that can be a source of infecting other people who come into contact with that same space. You're most contagious with any of these viruses, usually about two days before you start to develop symptoms and about five to seven days after you develop symptoms. And so there's this very definite window of about seven to 10 days when you're the most infectious. And then after that first couple of days when you develop symptoms, then the amount of virus that you have starts to decrease and you gradually become less infectious. But some people, such as children, or adults who have weakened immune system can actually spread these viruses for even longer because it takes their body's defenses a lot longer to clear out the virus. And so, you know, this sort of seven to 10 day rule, two days before, five days after is a general rule, but it's not necessarily true for every single person, which is why we tend to say if you're symptomatic, you know, cover your mouth when you cough, you know, wash your hands frequently, do all these different things to prevent yourself from transmitting the virus to others. That's right. And it's important to point out that the symptoms of these infections, for the most part, are indistinguishable among the three different viruses. So you really can't use symptoms to rule out or rule in any of these infections. You need to be tested. And again, that's because you can have more than one virus at the same time and you can have overlapping symptoms. So when you do have symptoms that are upper respiratory in nature, you would wanna contact your healthcare provider to protect your health, that of your family members, and you would wanna get tested. Uh, as an example, many people who get COVID-19 at this point, who've been previously immunized, will have mild illness or maybe no symptoms at all. By the same token, it can also be severe and uh, characterized by uh, deadly infection or complications. It can lead to symptoms, severe illness, and problems that can be very long lasting, like long COVID. And it can be especially dangerous for older adults or people who have certain health conditions. With influenza, again, some people may have mild symptoms, but it can also be severe and even deadly. Complications can happen to anyone, but we primarily see those complications among people who are 65 and older, younger than age five, who are pregnant, or who have other health conditions that place them at higher risk. And with RSV, some people, especially healthy adults, will have mild cold-like symptoms and just recover on their own in one to two week time period. But there are people at higher risk for severe illness, such as those who have a heart or lung condition or a weakened immune system older adults, 65 and older, babies born prematurely or those under one year of age, and children who have certain health conditions. Yeah, it's also um, important to make clear that even for just a purely viral respiratory infections, there are varying degrees of severity. I think you're right about that. I think COVID has really helped us make people aware of the varying degrees of illnesses you can have with viruses. I think many of us in the community 
my family, yours, we're all aware of what the flu is or what we think of as the flu, which is caused by the influenza viruses. It's typically a very acute illness. You develop sometimes a fairly high fever. You have body aches. You feel sort of really run down. And that lasts sometimes up to a week. And I think irrespective of your age, that can be an illness that you get that makes you quite sick and, and makes you quite debilitated. The older you are, the more severe that illness could be, and you can end up in the hospital. Similarly, in children, they might also end up in the hospital. And then RSV is slightly different in the sense that it doesn't necessarily give you that really high fever, but you get all the other things that you get with the flu. You might get a cough, a sore throat, you can have shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. And then COVID is really interesting because it spans the spectrum. Sometimes it looks like the flu and you're really, really sick and you have a high fever and your body's aching. And sometimes it looks like RSV where you're a little short of breath and you're wheezing, but maybe you don't have a fever. And I think what COVID has shown us is that when it comes to these viruses that can cause a more severe illness, they're not just a virus. All of them have such overlap so some of the symptoms that you'll see that overlap between these three include fever, cough, shortness of breath, and fatigue, sore throat, muscle aches, headache is the one that we hear a lot about. And if you're really lucky and you just have a mild illness, then you'll also have a runny or stuffy nose. So you can see a lot of overlap, some slight differences, but not enough to really help you distinguish just based on symptoms alone. Ultimately, though, they're all very threatening, especially to the most vulnerable in our society, and they're all viruses that we hope to prevent if we can. I'm really glad that you stressed that point, Dr. Branch, about the overlap, because uh, many times I've heard patients say, well, I, I thought it was just a cold, a virus. Well, they're probably right about it, but they don't understand the potential severity of that virus. You can't tell by symptoms alone. And as you stress, some of these infections can be very serious. And that's another reason why it's going to be important for people to talk with their healthcare provider and potentially to get tested. And the reason for that is we want people to be healthy, to get the care they need. And in some cases, we do have very specific treatments. So keeping people from getting sicker and keeping them out of the hospital are key. And the other point to make is that uh, for some of these infections, we do have vaccines available as well to prevent infection or at least to prevent the more severe manifestations of that infection. So getting all the vaccinations that your doctor recommends is really going to be important in helping to protect you, your family, those that you work with, worship with, go to school with. And this includes getting your full vaccine series and any boosters that are recommended. Yeah, that is just all so critically important. I couldn't agree with you more, um, Dr. Pullen. I'm such a huge proponent of getting tested when you have an illness, getting your kids tested. It's so interesting because kids often transmit viruses to their grandparents and then their grandparents end up hospitalized. And so, you know, if you're ill, go and get tested. Find out if you have COVID or influenza or RSV, not just to make sure that you get the right treatment, but also to protect the people around you and your families and your schools and at your jobs. Uh, and there are other ways you can help yourself and others as well, such as washing your hands well and often with clean running water and soap. Make sure that you get your back of your hands and between your fingernails and underneath your nails. That's something when we're in a hurry, we don't do, but it's a great place for viruses to kind of hide until you uh, come into contact with someone who is maybe not as healthy as you are. You'll want to do this for at least 20 seconds and then rinse your hands well under clean running water and then dry them with a clean towel or dry air. Um, you'll want to throw away all your used tissues when you wipe your nose, when you sneeze. You want to wash your hands before you touch other surfaces after you've sneezed or you've touched your own nose. That's a great way to prevent viruses from landing on surfaces and infecting other people. And then, of course, one of the benefits of getting tested and knowing that you have one of these viruses is that you can take the appropriate precautions to protect your loved ones. You can social distance, you can quarantine if, if you know that you're ill or you've recently been exposed. We've learned a lot about that over the last couple of years, and it works. It really helps to safeguard the health of those we care about. And so all of these are great strategies to really prevent the transmission of some of these serious infections within our communities. 
Absolutely agree. And uh, would, as we've all learned during this pandemic, would add that wearing a proper mask properly, being vaccinated, uh, staying home, as you mentioned, when you're ill, staying away from ill people or crowded indoor venues during respiratory virus season are all things that you can proactively do. Well, Dr. Branch, this has been a great discussion. I really want to thank you for joining me today. I know how busy you are. Any closing thoughts you have for our listeners? Yeah, I think we're headed into a, a really challenging winter season. We're already starting to see on the news that some of the viruses that we didn't see during the pandemic are starting to rear their ugly heads. Lots of RSV cases in children, lots of influenza cases. Keep track of what's happening in your community so that you can make good decisions as you're going to send your kids to school or you're going to work. You know, maybe this is a week that you do wear masks so that you prevent your kids and yourselves from getting ill. And again, just wanted to reiterate what you said, Dr. Poland, which is that if there's vaccines available for these viruses that you haven't gotten yet, it's not too late. There's never a point in the season when it's too late to get vaccinated and it will be beneficial to you. So thanks for having me today. It was great having this discussion and um, thanks to all our listeners. Thank you.